Hello, Reset with Raven family. Today's guest was over 200 pounds, financially bankrupt, unhappily married, and severely depressed, and made a choice to change. In her path to create a new lifestyle, she discovered who she truly is. She discovered her purpose. Welcome to Mar Nedford. Thank you so much for having me. It's an honor to be here today. I am excited to have you. Tomorrow, when I think of you, three words come to mind. Overcomer, strength, and courage. You're a life coach, best-selling author, a fellow podcaster, performance consultant, and champion for people in recovery, and a purpose-driven leader, a force, right? And I often think of the purpose discovery as a journey filled with doubt, fear, confusion, and uncertainty. Talk to us about how impactful traveling around North America was in your self-discovery. Wow. It's, you know, thank you for the introduction, by the way, that gave me goosebumps because I'm like, who is this person? Because sometimes it's still really hard to believe that I have been able to make these changes and I am where I am today. But um, I, I think the biggest reason that I found my purpose was because I overcame a lot of adversity. I actually started drinking and using drugs at the age of 14 because I never felt like I fit in at all. Everything was always awkward. I was a people pleaser. You know, my dad was very hard on me. And he's actually, I thank him today because he's given me the work ethic that I have now. But, you know, I always struggled to fit in. And when I found my solution to that, which was alcohol uh, for the most part, um, I felt like I was alive. I felt like I could be that person who I wanted or who I thought others wanted me to be, right? But at that point in my life, I stopped with the self-love, right? I didn't know how to love myself. I thought that my the way that I was, was I had to have other people's approval. So I was always seeking that recognition, that gold star. And of course, alcohol kind of hid that for me. And in my journey, I fell into harder drugs. I also became a chronic yo-yo dieter. And at a certain point after an incredibly abusive relationship, I actually decided, okay, I need to change. And instead of looking at, you know, what I had done to create all this chaos in my life, I thought, well, maybe I should just get married, right? Maybe I should have kids. I should do all the things that society tells me I should do. So I got married. I didn't have kids. Um, because of course I was drinking at the time and I thought, well, I can't go nine months without alcohol. That would be silly. Um, and my ex-husband now at the time, he was an alcoholic as well. And that stuff didn't make me any happier. You know, doing what I thought I should do actually made things worse. And so my depression um, escalated. I was medicated for a while. Um, I was still drinking. So I was not actually, you know, um, looking for solutions at the time, nor did I want to recognize the life I had created for myself. But, you know, about six years into my marriage, like you said, I was 215 pounds. I was incredibly unhappily married and through a lot of it, my own fault. Um, I was severely depressed and I wanted to end my life. And I just remember sitting there with a bottle of pills in my hand and I had a dog. His name was Rudy. He was a little pug and he just kind of looked up at me and I felt in that moment that there was this divine intervention, right? Where I thought I need to make a change. I felt like something was telling me I had a purpose in life. And that is actually my first, you know, pivot in life was recognizing that what I had been through was actually something that I could utilize as a gift to help other people. But it was really hard to get to that point, right? Because my whole life, like you said, I traveled around North America, I had a good job, you know, I ended up getting sober, I got all this stuff. But I didn't know what my purpose was. You know, I just kept seeking it from external sources. That's very interesting. Um, I heard something just yesterday that is really shaping the way I, I see life and, and it it's making me really do a lot of reflection. And it was that some things that we thought were negative or we thought that they were, you know, this is awful. It was development. 
And you had to go through these things to become who you are today. Um, your, your, your book, your podcast, who you are um, as a person today wouldn't be as rich, wouldn't be as full had you not had that, that pain and that development. So talk to us more about, so you, you said you had this divine intervention of needing to basically figure out that self-love. What were some of the first steps you took to rediscover who, who's Tamar? And what, what is Tamar love? Because there, there's definitely a huge, um, I think, thing, that especially as women, of people pleasing, of this is what society says, this is what my husband says, this is what you know I'm supposed to do. I want to know because I feel like that inner work is, is the real work. That's the best work. What did you do? to rediscover and to reset and put your life back on track and live for you. So like you kind of mentioned, I had lost my identity, right? I was always striving to do what I thought was the right thing. And the interesting part of my journey is I actually started off with looking at the external sources like I, you mm -hmm. know, we so often do. And because I was overweight, I thought I just got to lose weight. If I lose 75 pounds, people will love me. I'll feel like I'm beautiful again and everything. Like I figured that that would actually fix everything, right? But it didn't fix any any struggle that I was experiencing on the inside. So I started on that path wanting to get healthy, which was a good thing because it eventually led me into recovery. Um, but I was still doing a lot of parallels with my addictive behavior, um, you know, uh, with my drinking and now with my fitness, you know, I went 100% all in, I worked out every day, I ate chicken, broccoli and rice every single day. And I'm like, I'm going to get that gold star, right? And I was so fixated on that. But the cool part, and this is why I say that divine information, uh, uh, divine intervention is because the person that I picked to be my personal trainer actually was in recovery. So mm -hmm. over the path of my journey, my first um, six months, um, I, I, we became friends and we actually went to high school together. We were in gymnastics. We were terrible, by the way. I'm definitely not a gymnast. <laughs> um, and so we started to develop this relationship and she saw these habits that I had with being like, hey, I only had nine drinks this weekend, but I was also drinking a half a bottle of NyQuil, right? Mm -hmm. every, every, every time I drank to fall asleep. And so... Nobody who has those problems obviously has to brag about the fact that they didn't have a drink on the weekend. So eventually all that led to my bottom, um, which is when I decided to stop digging. I went into recovery. And the first thing I started to do was actually look back on my life. I wrote out my whole life story, which was very difficult. And I read it to somebody out loud and reading that and actually seeing, whoa, this is unmanageable, right? Like I've made a mess. So I think for me that the first step was really recognizing that I needed to change. And then I developed, you know, faith in a higher power, which was huge for me because I'm a very spiritual person. I've never really grown up religious, but now I believe that there was always something looking out for me because I'm alive and I'm here to share my story today. And then it was cleaning up that past, right? That allowed me to reset because I actually went to everybody that I felt like I had harmed and I had a mm. conversation with them like, hey, what could I do better? How can I regain your trust? And slowly over time, I've started living a lifestyle to show people, right? A lot of people get upset when people don't forgive them. But when you've broken that trust, it's a matter of showing people that, hey, this is the lifestyle, right? And they'll eventually see. So that I think was how I developed my foundation and what really started my initial reset. How did you find the, the courage and the strength to go to people? Because I remember on your pack, podcast, the, the Road Beyond Recovery, you talked about the importance of doing things that scare you. Right. And I think that going to people to say, hey, I, you know, I, I may have or not, I may have. I did. You know, I did something that was wrong or I harmed you or I was whatever and, and asked for their forgiveness. How, how did you develop the courage, the strength and 
how did you know that you needed to do that? So it's one thing to know you need to do it. It's another thing to say, no, I, I need to approach and address this um, to that person directly. I had a lot of really great support uh, when I came into recovery. I had people that cared about me enough to hurt my feelings in a very mm-hmm. loving way, right? Because I thought I knew it all, right? I thought I was the general manager of my universe. I could control everybody and everything in it. Apparently, I can't. And they weren't afraid to tell me, like, you have to be open-minded to these things. You have to clean up your past. You have to clear your conscience because, you know, as we develop resentments against people, places, or things, and if we hold on to it, the only person that's really harming is us. And so I was told, listen, this is a part in you making sure that you can live a more responsible life is going back and owning your part because most often when we've got a resentment towards something, we always, someone, we always play a part in it, right? Because Mm -hmm. we're the ones that are getting angry. And so I had, you know, people that love me, push me and said, this is just part of the process. And I remember my dad was the first one that I went to and him and I are exactly the same. And (laughs) he always gave me tough love. So it was really hard. And I just like, I was so scared, right? I don't like conflict. I still don't like conflict. And I just said, dad, you know what? I'm really sorry that I put so much strain on our relationship because of Mm -hmm. the damage that I had done and the way I acted. And he was shocked to hear that from me. So that kind of took, you know, I was like, okay, just be quiet, be quiet. And I had to learn just to listen. And what I got out of that experience is his perspective right? Because everybody's got their perspective on things and we're always make assumptions. But he said, you know, I didn't know what to do. You were so out of control. I confided in friends. They told me to give you tough love. So that's what I did. And I didn't know that. I just thought he was a big jerk, right? But he wasn't. He actually loved me enough to push me away and say, when you're ready, I'm still here for you, right? And so it was scary and it's scary to confront that. But I think it's, a, it's part of the cleansing process. Mm. And speaking of cleansing, I want to know, how were you able to retrain your mind and remove or silence limiting beliefs? That took a lot of work. Um, After my first year being sober, I actually felt like I'd graduated from a course. I thought I'm good. I don't have to do anything, right? I slowly started to gain some of the weight back because I had lost 75 pounds. But then I felt really complacent. I felt like I was settling in life. And I didn't want to be in that position because I had made it through what I've gone through for a reason. You know, like I had been trained in, you know, life to do to have a bigger purpose. And so In 2019, I finally got sick of being complacent. I got sick of settling. It got painful enough for me that it started to get really uncomfortable sitting in what I thought was comfort, right? Because it was what I knew. I felt I should be grateful that I have a good career. I should be grateful that my life is back in order and I have the people I love. But I felt like I wasn't really doing anything to help improve, you know, the world as a whole, like I wanted to give back for everything that I had done. So I started doing that self analysis and really took a look at my beliefs, right? My beliefs told me that I was an alcoholic, who's going to take me seriously. I've wasted 22 years of my life, people will look at that and think, well, who are you to do this, right? I barely passed high school. Who are who am I to write two books, right? I I can't. I'm not a writer. Um, So my head was telling me all these things, but because I had conditioned myself to believe those things, that is, I would always confirm if I would try something and didn't work because I didn't apply myself. That was confirmation to me that I wasn't good enough to do those things. So I had to look at that where those beliefs started. And go, okay, well, I'm going to try this and see because it's an opportunity for me to grow. So I did write those two books, right? I just one step, one foot in front of the other, and I just did it, right? I also surrounded myself with people who believed in me enough until I could believe in myself fully. Oh, that's so good. Oh, there's so many things you just said, Um, especially the part about when I didn't believe it, of course, you know, I I, I was like, oh yeah, it's just confirmation that it failed. I believe in self-fulfilling prophecy. I believe that 
if you if whatever you put out in the atmosphere, the energy, the universe, your thoughts about it, that shapes it. And we and people sometimes don't recognize how much like if the way you focus on something, oh, and put negative energy towards it, you've already like sank the ship. Oh, that was so good. And we have to talk about your books. I am super excited for you. Um, I think what you have accomplished in a short amount of time, and really it's those 20 years of buildup again, back to how we were talking about that development. But I know 2020 was a huge year for you. Share with us uh, why and talk to us more about um, your books and just that process of writing a book. Because I know um, offline we talked about, again, how there was some fear. There was some, well, who will read it or who will listen to me? And I I can completely relate to that. I was like, oh, she's, she's singing the songs that, you know, I've also had in my head, you know, I call it the lies we tell ourselves. So tell us more about what 2020 was for you. It was actually an amazing year. I know a lot of stuff happened in 2020, but I looked at it as because I was traveling so much before that. I'm like, I got to do something. Now is my opportunity. Like we are slowing down for a reason here. We got to stay home. And so I started life coaching because I was already helping people learn how to get sober, just like I had. And I loved seeing the light go on in their eyes when they realized like, hey, maybe I can do this. And maybe I am meant for this kind of life. And that really filled my cup. And they always say in recovery that when we help other people, it actually helps us more. That is what keeps me sober is helping other people. And it's the same, I think, in everything we do in life, right? When we're other people centered, we start to fo- we don't focus on ourselves as much. We start to focus on others. We show up better in the lives of the people we love. And so I actually um, had a mentor of mine. She's like, why don't you write your story? Like, why have you never written your story? And at the time I had a health podcast. So it was the road to health. Um, And I documented my journey while I was traveling, how to regain control over my health. Because eating is something I love. I love food. I love sugar. um, And it's something I have to be very mindful of today because it does take over much like my alcoholism did. And so I thought, okay, you know, but what what will people say, right? I was worried about my parents because they did not know the extent of my addiction, but I was encouraged to do it because they said, listen, if you write a book and you share your story, what if even 10 people read your book and they want to get sober? What if they realize, hey, this is actually a gift, right? My, My past is a gift that I can use to help other people. And so that's what I did. And I, you know, took a course because I thought, okay, if I wing this, like I so often do with everything, I'm, you know, going to crash and realize I should probably back up and start over and learn a little bit. So I was very into that self-education. And I thank my therapist because she was there with me every step of the way. You know, she warned me this, you're going to bring up a lot of things and your body will probably has probably hit a lot of things, right? Or you know, it's stored in the body. And that's exactly what happened. As I started to relive my past, as I wrote, you know, each chapter out, I got very emotional about it. It was very healing. It was very cleansing. But I had somebody there to go, okay, I've just remembered this part of because I went through abusive relationships. And that was hard to write about. But it felt so good to get out after. And when I got that print copy of the book for the first time, and I held that in my hand, and I saw my name on it, it was almost an empowering feeling. And in a way that was like, okay, I can do this, right? If and I if I can do it, anybody can do it. And I actually had friends read um, the book, and they're like, we want more. And my parents read it overnight, both of them. <laughs> and I got a, a phone call the next day. But they actually said, thank you for sharing your story. We had no idea how bad things got because we knew you hit a lot. So it was almost like I opened the door and, you know, some people might not like that I shared my story, but for those that it would help, it was definitely worth the experience. That is awesome. And I think even through platforms such as this, like a podcast, I think hearing people's stories um, it gives you courage. It gives you empowerment. And you mentioned this earlier when you see that, oh, well, someone else did it. I can do it too. And you you just never know 
who needs to hear your message, who needs to hear your story, who needs just a pick me up today. Like, wow. Like, or if you're feeling just so low and thinking, how do I get out of this? I, one of the things that really moved me even to, to do this podcast is I think so many people are in transition. So many people are needing to reset their lives due to, I think the pandemic was a wake up call for a lot of people. It's like, let me, let me reevaluate some things. Let me see how I'm, you know, showing up in the world. You know, what are my finances like? What's my career like? What's my family time right? What do I value? This has been the biggest time for me personally to think about what are my values and what actions do I take that honor my values? So one of the things I know also a big transition for you was leaving your corporate job. And I think when you're leaving um, what some may call like a stable check or a check that you're accustomed to regularly getting, um, there can be, again, a lot of fear and a lot of, okay, what if this doesn't work out? And as someone who also has, has recently taken that leap of faith, I want you to share with us, you know, where kind of your headspace, your mind was as you took that leap and kind of where you are today. So, I think because my journey was so, I I had done things that I never thought I could achieve. It started to build my confidence. And the more I dove into what do I want to do in life? What am I passionate about? It allowed me to develop a love for getting up in the morning. You know, like when you, and this is why I always tell people like, take the time to discover your calling or your purpose. And it it might not be something that's paid. It may be just something that you're meant to do in this world. When you take the time to discover your purpose, you start to enjoy waking up in the morning. And for me, I was waking up at 3 4 a.m. for quite a while there because I had my corporate job. And so from seven to four, four thirty. That was what I had to focus on. And um, as I went through my journey, I started getting more clients. I start, you know, I wrote my second book. My time was getting very full. And I knew that with my personality, because I'm a very A-type personality, when I put my mind to something, I'm all in. I knew that uh, because I have this habit of being really excited, going all in, burning out, having to step back. Like I really pushed the boundaries of how much that I can accomplish. I was doing this as well. But I remember in, you know, I had thought maybe I'll take a leave of absence. Um, And for me, it was that security, right? Like it's hard to take that leap of faith and just leave your day job because I've had two periods in my life where, you know, when I went bankrupt after my, my marriage ended, and then when I was young and I was in an abusive relationship, I, you know, had to do credit counseling. So I've always had that fear of financial insecurity, right? But I sat down with, and I think I just, I'm so grateful for the friends that I have, especially in this space, right? Meeting people like yourself as well is I had a coach friend sit me down and she's like, you know, what are you doing? When are you going to do this thing full time? Like you've got this purpose. And could you imagine if what you're doing, you could put 40 hours a week into. And I said, yeah, you're right. And I said, I'm going to take a leave of absence and see how it goes. I want to travel And she's like, why would you do that? And I told her, I was honest. I said, it's that fear. It's that financial insecurity. Like I've got a good job now. And she was like, Tamar, when you quit drinking, did you keep a bottle of vodka in the cupboard just in case you wanted to go back? (laughs) And now (laughs) that resonated with me because I was like, no, I didn't actually. And I'm not saying, you know, just quit your job and do what you love. I mean, there is definitely, I had been doing it for almost a year at that point. And I just felt so strongly about my purpose that I knew eventually, like if I waited until I felt ready, I was never going to be ready. But when she said that, that was very profound for me. The next day I wrote my letter of reference and I gave my notice and I just said, I have to follow what I love. And I just started writing out like I've learned in coaching. What is the worst that can happen? Right. Mm. So every day I get to wake up now and do what I love. And it's scary sometimes but I love what I'm doing. And that overrides the fear. 
I love what you just said. I actually was just thinking last week that, you know, if you have a plan B, maybe you need to rethink your plan A because you're not committed enough to your plan A. So that's huge what you said, um, what you said about, oh, do you just keep the alcohol around just in case? I think that goes back to being so committed so focused and so in alignment with what you said, your purpose and calling, like I am meant to do this. I was born for this. Um, I'm the one. I'm the only one that could share my story. I'm the only one that could talk about the road beyond recovery from my experiences, from my vantage point. And because I am the one, someone needs to hear that message from me. So before I ask my final question, where can we find you online? The best place is my website. So you can go to www.theroadforward.ca and that has all my social media links. Uh, My favorite place to hang out is Instagram, which is The Road Beyond Recovery, which is also my podcast. Awesome. Awesome. And the final question, what's the biggest lesson you've learned in your reset? That my adversity and the addiction that I've been through has allowed me to discover my purpose in life. And now I realize that my sobriety is actually my superpower. That was a gift given to me to help other people in the world. So use your experience. Lovely. Thank you so much. This was amazing. 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 Thank you for having me. All right, everyone, a wonderful conversation yet again. Be open-minded and available to feedback. You don't have to be the general manager of your own universe. You can have a board of directors. Share your story. It's a gift to people. Take the time to discover your calling and your purpose. You all, this conversation doesn't stop here. I'm Raven M. Harris on all social platforms, and I invite you to connect with me. I'd love to hear about your journey and resetting your life. And you all know I only have one ask. If this message was of value to you, don't keep a good thing to yourself. Share it with someone. Text it, email it, and spread the word with your friends and family. I'm on a mission to help as many people as possible reset their lives in the forward direction. Because remember, a reset is always available to you.